Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back my friend, Chris Kiefer, Dr. Chris Kiefer. He is uh, joining us from Toronto, Ontario. He is the director of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Chris, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. Robert, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think this is the third time. I feel like we're becoming good friends. Uh, oh, it was the third it's time. Okay, see, I'm losing count here. I'm, I'm uh, bad at counting. But uh, yeah, second, third, it's always great to see you again. And uh, there's lots to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I gave you just a quick title, but uh, you know, uh, guests introduce themselves, so I don't have to remind you of this. Tell tell us who you are. I do for sure. So um, I am. Uh, I always like how you start off with your family. So I'm going to steal a page from your book. Um, I'm the proud father of a beautiful three and a half year old boy. Um, as you mentioned, what's I'm his an name? Emergency. His name is Liam Finn. Liam Finn. Okay. And, and he's the best little boy that's ever been. Um, but that's that's just my opinion. <laughs> okay. um, I understand a lot of parents feel that way. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm an emergency physician, as you mentioned. Um, involved a lot in um, simulation-based medical education, which is a whole other topic, but a lot of fun. Uh, but my interest in the last three or four years has strangely pivoted um, towards energy and nuclear um, uh, uh, providing, uh, sorry, I guess... <laughs> It's it's the sort of triage ethic that I have for medicine, which is about identifying the most pressing problems um, and steering limited resources in the most uh, you know skillful way towards towards solving those. And uh, you know, I am a climate hawk for sure, and that's what led me towards uh, a real embrace of nuclear energy as the logical solution that can guarantee both effective climate action, but also you know economic prosperity, energy security, all, all the stuff we should really be be caring about holistically in order to do this right. Well, that's great. I, w I want to talk about that idea around a, a, a different vision for the grid and, and what that means. But it, it bring us up to date on, we've talked by phone and WhatsApp uh, in the last few days, bring us up to date about what's happening in Canada and why there seems to be a kind of a rebirth of interest in, in nuclear energy in Canada. What's going on? Oh, man, Robert, I mean, how long you got? This is a really exciting topic yeah, for me. Less I'm an hour, an hour or less. So cut to the all chase. Right, right. Kill, kill the babies. That's the uh, the old news line about, you know, oh, kill boy. the. Yeah. So so give us the give us the headlines here. Yeah, I mean, Robert, it's been a really dizzying journey. Um, as I was saying, I've been in this field for a little over three years now. We held our first uh, stand up for nuclear event. This is a global advocacy movement that holds in person demonstrations around the world. And that's kind of where I caught the bug. You know, we had about six people in uh, in one of our main sort of city squares here in, Tor in Toronto, in Canada's largest city, um, you know, handing out homemade pamphlets, talking to whoever we could, mostly, you know, homeless and mentally ill people. But, you know, that's where we are humble beginnings. And um, last week, um, you know, just to give you a sense of how things have changed, the way the ground shifted under our feet, just from an advocacy perspective, um, I was on uh, Parliament Hill, I guess that's the equivalent of our sort of Capitol Hill, um, you know, meeting with uh, members of both uh, of the main sort of natural parties of governance. It's always kind of sloppy making um, comparisons between Canada and the US, but essentially kind of the Democrats and Republicans, if you will. Uh, my Canadian listeners, I got to apologize for that gross oversimplification, but uh, meeting with uh, with caucuses uh, of both parties. There are actually dedicated nuclear caucuses within the Liberal and Conservative Party, uh, but also meeting with uh, actual cabinet ministers. I met the Minister of Defense, um, the Minister of Housing and Social Development, um, met a, a senator who's invited me to speak on the Senate Committee of the uh, you know Energy, um, Environment, and uh, and Natural Resources Committee. So. Um, it's it's really been sort of a, a dizzying rise here, and yeah, you have to ask yourself why. What is it about nuclear in Canada that's kind of throwing open these doors? Why are why are politicians in particular uh, so interested? And why? I mean, you're you're kind of coming coming at me from Texas here, and why is that so different from the U.S.? So, um, you know that that's a big a big question to answer. Um, <clears throat> But I'd say Canada is kind of unique in the West. Um, you know, we have managed to maintain our nuclear sector um, and, and it, it's not atrophied in the same way that it has across the West. Um, you know, our Canada reactors benefit from essentially being immortal. Um, the internals can be swapped out every 30 to 40 years um, and then we can keep these things running and running and running. Um, and we've done that with um, a good chunk of our reactor fleet and we're doing it with almost the rest of it. Um, and what that means is that we have an active workforce, an active supply chain, active expertise, and it's Canada's largest infrastructure project. It's a $26 billion investment 
which keeps us as uh, you know, uh, with with a certain amount of industrial capacity, we have heavy forging capacity, we're making our own um, steam generators, and we have a supply chain, you know, Canada is this really interesting tier one nuclear nation where not only do we have, you know, the world's richest, um, highest ore grade uranium in the world, but we do our own fuel manufacturing. Um, we have our own, you know, engineering and technology, our own Kandu reactor, which I think is a country we should be very proud of. And so we've captured all of the value within that supply chain. So despite nuclear, you know, I'm not trying to paint a picture of Canada that's totally rosy. Um, you know, our, our uh, particular governing political party um, has a very contradictory approach to the sector. Um, there's enough, you know, what Emmett Penny would call path dependency and inertia within the system. Um, and it's just such common sense, particularly in the light of the mounting global energy crisis um, and the, really the geopolitical crisis that the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has set off that, you know, as part of this global return to nuclear, um, Canada is very well positioned um, to, to take advantage of that. And it's really just in our, in our sort of vital national interest um, and of course, climate is always a tertiary concern when the rubber actually meets the road. Sure. So it's nice to see those things aligning, you know, the, the energy security, the national interest and and climate uh, climate impact. Well, so let me ask you about that, because I think that's an interesting point. You know, I think that the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine should certainly be an inflection point when it comes to the issues of energy. And, you know, as Ted Nordhouse says, that climate will climate policy will take a backseat to energy policy. But how much of this this resurgence in interest or the increase in bipartisan interest in nuclear in Canada has been uh, uh, brought to the fore by the by the, the the war in Ukraine? Is that does that figure into this? It does. I mean, this is this is very fresh stuff. Um, and and probably it, it it has to do more so with um, you know the ways in which the the Russian invasion is further driving up prices. I think that's the ultimate uh, pressure point, and that's why you're seeing countries like you know the UK under Boris Johnson committing to building not just one new uh, large you know EPR reactor, but actually eight. Um, why you're seeing the turnaround in France? Why even Belgium? Right. Um, is partially reversing its nuclear phase out. Um, obviously, we're not as connected to that problem um, in Canada. We have, you know, the benefit of being your neighbor um, and and having, you know, benefited from historically cheap natural gas prices. But even that is changing because, you know, I think we're about to see the U.S. embark on what I'm calling an energy Marshall Plan for Europe. Um, you know, Europe has made this commitment, realistic or not, to get off uh, Russian fossil fuels and particularly natural gas within right. five years. Um, and that's going to see you know, a natural gas sector in the States, which, you know, to my limited understanding, again, as a uh, amateur energy enthusiast, um, it's, you know, there's there's a situation in the U.S. where there's been underinvestment in, in, in the fracking industry where, you know, the drilled and uncompleted wells are running out. Where we're seeing prices spiking. I was just checking uh, and it looks like we're up to uh, $8 per million BTUs. Um, that's a quadrupling of natural gas prices. And, and I think it's really changing the calculus uh, here in Ontario, where we've been planning on shutting down one of our, you know, enormous nuclear power plants and replacing it with gas capacity. It's an issue that I'm really active on, on, on advocating for the refurbishment of the Pickering nuclear generating station. But, you know, the facts on the ground are changing rapidly. Um, you know, the politicians are thirsty, I think, um, and they're playing catch up, trying to understand this new reality. And, and luckily, um, you know, we've been really uniquely positioned in Canada as the only civil society, all volunteer nuclear advocacy group who are willing uh, to be bold, um, to throw open the Overton window or just what is possible um, within nuclear um, and make make the impossible possible again. Um, so I'm, I'm just if, so excited. If I can interrupt, because I, I think yeah. what's interesting, too, as you're talking about this is the that Canada has this more cohesive supply chain and the unionized workforce behind it. And just a quick station break. So I'm talking to Chris Kiefer, Canadians for Nuclear Energy is his, he's the founder of that group, right? You're the founder of the, of the, of, the, of Canadians for Nuclear Energy, Chris? I'm the president, but there's president. A, a group, a group of founders. Yeah. Okay. A group of founders. And just uh, so you can find them at C4NE.ca. That's C letter, uh, numeral 4NE.ca. Um, but I thought it was just, you know, what how you ran through the fact that well, we have our own uranium, we we can we uh, refine it ourselves, we have our own uh, reactor design, we have this embedded and, and now trained workforce over generations. 
And when I look at the U.S., I'm thinking we have none of that. We have none of this kind of cohesion around nuclear energy in the U.S., and we certainly don't have any kind of bipartisan support that's needed, as you probably noticed during his State of the Union address, President Biden didn't use the word nuclear energy one time, didn't didn't mention those words not once, which I thought was a, I mean, a, just an egregious oversight, particularly given what's happening. But but I'm, I'm pleased to hear, well, it, it, it seems to me that what Canada, the, the reaction in Canada and what you're seeing there is the more appropriate response to what we've seen with the invasion of Ukraine. And we haven't seen anything similar here in the U.S. And it makes me... Uh, makes me well I'm not ready to move to toronto but i mean <laughs> that, that it seems more that's a, a more proper and, and measured political response than what we're seeing here in the u.s which is kind of just to ignore it ignore the promise of nuclear energy well i mean first off robert mi casa is two casas so whenever you want to move up you're uh, you're most welcome <laughs> but we do have uh, i think i think we might be the most expensive real estate in the world right now we have a quite the uh the real estate balloon but all, all that aside i mean i don't want to paint an overly rosy picture I'm, I'm describing the government as taking baby steps here and i'm really happy to discuss again this this highly contradictory uh policy towards energy which i and, and nuclear energy which i think is starting to be clarified um, but you, you you stressed again the importance of this uh you know supply chain which is again 96 percent indigenous here in canada we have independent economic analysis that says for every dollar that we invest in can do nuclear, we get a dollar 40 back in GDP growth, right? And this paints the stark contrast between competing visions of, you know, what this net zero or energy transition world will look like, particularly when it comes to a just transition, because, you know, what are the costs in nuclear? Once the plants are built, it's dirt cheap uranium, and we don't even need to enrich the stuff here in Canada because our candles will burn anything, right? And labor. Um, and so we have parking lots, you know, with 3000 parking spots, because we, we don't just build one can do here, we put eight of them, um, you know, in a single site. Um, and so you pay people, you know, you pay tradespeople six figure salaries, and that money bounces around in their community, it gets spent in their community, it stimulates the local economy. And so that's why we see this incredible benefit. Um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, again, not wanting to paint an overly rosy picture, the context of this recent advocacy, and I think why things have really taken off is we went from in our last uh, parliamentary session, which had almost the exact same seat composition, we had a snap election that was an attempt to get a majority government by our, our liberal party, it kind of backfired, the, the, the parliament's the exact same, but we had a really important cabinet shuffle, where we had a prominent Minister of Natural Resources, Seamus O'Regan, who was saying bold things like there is no path to net zero without nuclear. CANDU is a gold standard reactor around the world. And, you know, really scratching his head, talking about how the, the environmental NGOs are anti-mining. Where the hell do they think all the, you know, the, the minerals are going to come from that are going to, you know, supplant the hydrocarbons supposedly, right? We got instead the next most, you know, it, it, the cabinet shuffle gave us um, a former Greenpeace activist um, who repelled off the CN Tower to protest climate change. I mean, a real committed guy with, you know, a record in the anti-nuclear movement of opposing, you know, every single nuclear nuclear thing possible, right? And this is uh, Gilbo, right? This is Stephen Gilbo. And, Gilbo, yeah. You know, okay. Yeah, I mean, I had an interaction with him that I talked about um, when we uh, debriefed about COP26, um, where I, I confronted him and I said, listen, you know, you have this uh, principled, stance as an anti-nuclear activist, you know, will that cloud your judgment as uh, as our minister of the environment, given the IPCC and all of its principal decarbonization pathways says, hey, we're going to need a big increase in nuclear energy. He said at the time, a government has no role in this. And he quoted some levelized cost numbers and well, nuclear is just going to have to compete in the market. Six months later, um, he's in charge of developing our green bond framework. Um, and it uh, excludes nuclear. It's justified by a single sentence saying, you know, it's just green finance. This is the, the practice out there. But he went further. And he really trolled the nuclear sector, you know, workers who I consider to be clean air, climate and medical heroes um, because of our medical isotope production. But he trolled them by placing them in the same category as gambling, the, the manufacture of tobacco and alcohol, uh, you know, firearms. We don't we don't like guns as much as you guys down there, but he, he really put it in the sin stock category. And this led to a. Uh, you know, we, we put forward a petition to the House of Commons. It's a very interesting democratic mechanism where if you get enough signatures and a sponsoring MP, your petitions read on the floor of the House of Commons. The government's mandated to provide a written response. It was a real lightning rod and it got about 10,000 signatures in a month, which is 
pretty decent for Canada. Um, and it really put a bee in the bonnet um, of, of the government. And, um, you know, in my discussions um, with both the opposition party, the conservatives and, and the liberals, there is a huge openness to nuclear. Once you lay out the facts, there's really not a lot of prejudices there. And I'm going to take a break to let you get some words in here, Robert, but I have a very interesting theory as to why that is. Well, so I'll interject just one quick point, and which is that what, what was the quote? It was a guy that Vic Reese, he used to work at the Department of Energy, and he was talking about this partisan split around nuclear. And he said, the problem with nuclear, and he's talking about the con Congress in the U.S., he said that uh, Republicans are pro-nuclear and anti-government, and Democrats are anti-nuclear and pro-government. So we need... Right government officials who are pro-nuclear and pro-government. And it seems to me, as I've thought about this a lot, and we've talked about it before, for the, in, nuclear to succeed in the U.S., we're going to need pro-government, pro-nuclear people. And we don't have that in the Biden crowd. We just don't have it. I, I think they're the no. most anti-nuclear administration in American history. And I don't take any pleasure in saying that. And, you know, I've talked to different people who push back on that. But I mean, you look at what's happening at the NRC. But but continue on about that, that uh, the the where that common interest or commonality of interest in Canada and the, the idea of Canada, I guess when you were talking about what the success of the country is, you're seeing the liberals and the conservatives coming to the same kind of view on nuclear. Why is that? From where does that come? Well, I mean, as you mentioned, there's an incredible opportunity for consensus here. And, you know, my organization has been creating uh, briefing memos uh, for these caucuses, for cabinet ministers. You know, um, we're really seeding ideas up through the backbenches, up to the highest level of government. Um, and that's that's a very exciting opportunity because, again, the nuclear industry is so um, short sighted in terms of its aspirations. You know, the only thing that has social and political license right now is, is small modular reactors in Canada. And that's partially the industry's fault because that's the only thing it'll advocate for, mm. you know, by throwing, throwing that Overton window open by saying, here's, you know, we're, we're going to advocate for something that's, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous that it's controversial, but the refurbishment of, you know, one of our large nuclear generating stations um, and the building of more large nuclear, you know, we, by advocating over on that side, we win, you know, sprinklings of government support on the SMR stuff. But, but when you only advocate for the most conservative thing that currently has social and political license, you don't win much at all, right? So this is just classic. I mean, I really observed this, you know, when Obama won the presidency, the Senate and the House, and then proceeded to immediately try and build a sort of bipartisan agenda and, and water down all of the political capital he had. You don't you don't build out a bold vision by compromising immediately, right? You stake out, you know, a bold claim. Um, and so we, we've we been really successful, um, I think, with doing that. And, and things things are really shifting. And, and our talking points are near identical for the, you know, the conservatives, the liberals, and our sort of left-wing social democrats, slightly peripheral party, the, the new democratic party. It's, you know, we emphasize different things. We em emphasize more economic, like climate action with economic prosperity, with energy security to the conservatives. We, we emphasize more um, the climate talking points with the liberals and with the, the NDP, the social democratic party, the natural party of labor. Um, we emphasize the just transition because I was talking earlier about this, you know, this competing vision. What, what is our economy? What is our energy system going to look like? It can either be high tech, high skills, you know, very skilled tradespeople, engineers, um, you know, a, a almost an exclusively unionized workforce with excellent, you know, long term intergenerational jobs tied to communities that thrive. Right. That's one option. Or we have this dystopian wind and solar future where we import all of our technology um, and our you know energy infrastructure from places like china vietnam because let's face it not even europe can build wind turbines you know um uh anymore you know the costs are just getting too high especially with commodities ticking up um do we become a nation of solar panel installers you know take a 50 percent maybe more pay cut for our, our workers move into low skill jobs essentially just screwing solar panels onto fucking metal frames um, jobs that I, I compare to sort of like energy carny jobs, you know, like carnival workers that go from town to town, right? These are intermittent jobs providing intermittent energy. You know, they're they're delocalized. Um, and I mean, it, like it's it's really a dist and, and, and it produces as you know, we've talked about the grid as the commons, the 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 vital um, life support structure of modern civilization. Um, you know, that's what's at stake. Um, and so, you know, I can make arguments right across the political spectrum that I think are incredibly cohesive and that paint a much rosier picture of what's possible. But I wanted to just say briefly, sure. um, and we can explore this in more detail, what's so different about Canada and the U.S.? And there, there's a few things, as I mentioned, the supply chain, et cetera. The internal logic is stronger in, in Canada. But in terms of the political culture, 
Um, the U.S. suffers from something called the nonprofit industrial complex, right? <laughs> yes. And and you know, it's it, the nonprofit sector in the U.S. is worth more than a trillion dollars. It's larger than probably the majority of the world's economies, for God's sakes. And my understanding of the reason it is that way is because it's a beautiful tax avoidance mechanism for ultra wealthy Americans um to uh to you know sprinkle money on foundations and and nonprofits get a nice tax receipt and it's a way you know, it's very libertarian it's you know why would i pay you know taxes to the government lose control of where that money gets spent um when i can sort of you know steer that money towards what what my interests are in a way i mean i can see why it's attractive but in another way if we need the state to do bold things and set industrial policy and do the kind of things we used to do when we built the grid by five percent per year in the 50s 60s and 70s it's it's got to go the other way but when you have a nonprofit industrial complex, um, you have environmental NGOs, anti-nuclear environmental NGOs that have annual operating budgets of over $1 billion, right? And that means they're infiltrated right across the intelligentsia, right up into the White House. I forget her name, but former NRDC uh, chairwoman who's an advisor Gina, on Gina climate. McCarthy, the senior climate advisor in the Biden administration. And they're right, not going to so, speak up and they're not going to speak up for the 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 preservation of the Palisades nuclear plant in Michigan. They said bupkis about the closure of the Indian Point nuclear plant in New York. They said bupkis yep. about the closure of nuclear plants in Illinois. They haven't said a word about the closure of the Diablo Canyon uh, nuclear plant in California. I mean, it's just it, it truly is disgusting to me. I mean, and I say that I use that word. It's the right word. I, it's total disgust. If these yeah. are the climate hawks, what are you doing? I mean, what are you doing? This is the easy, this, this is the low hanging fruit. But let me jump Absolutely. back to what you what you said about the conservatives versus the nuclear and the Labor Party, what uh, the new Democratic Party. I thought that was interesting. You, you know, you, what do you how do you appeal to those different interests? Well, with the conservatives, you say energy security with the with the liberals, you talk about climate and with the labor guys, you talk about good union jobs, which something I've seen myself at Indian Point, where when one, once Indian Point closed that that uh, Buchanan, New York, they lost it was a 1000 or more new, you know, high paying intergenerational union jobs where you, you could families could make it on one salary. And, yeah. and 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 that's completely lost. And and I, I look at the the liberals in the US, the Democrats, I'm thinking, well, who are you supporting? What are you who are you representing? You say you yeah. represent the poor in the middle class, but here they are and you're you're abandoning them. And now with gas, nat gas prices going up, electricity prices are skyrocketing. And that's completely regressive. So I, I, I think you're, you know, it's just interesting to see how your journey has progressed over the years. And I admire what you're doing. I think, but I, I just don't see a pathway in the U.S., for the activism you're doing, because as you say, these NGOs are so powerful inside the beltway that there's, there's effectively no chance of getting getting this message heard in any kind of way that's going to really reverberate, particularly in this administration. And well, I mean, let me paint it. Me... It's depressing, I think, in my view, it's very depressing. Let me uh, paint a biblical um, visual image for you here. Robert. Okay, sure. Um, I talk a lot about, you know, the kind of ideological battle of ideas, right? Because fundamentally, yeah. you know, we're, this is a battle of ideas. We have competing models of what the future would look like. And I kind of laid out that, you know, nuclear based model versus the, uh, the, you know, nation of solar panel installers installers model. Um, but let's talk about the forces arrayed on that battlefield. And I'm going to argue that it's a real David and Goliath struggle on, on the one side, we have that probably more than a billion dollars of annual operating revenue collection of the, uh, the usual suspects the NRDC, the Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, et cetera, right? And on the other side, let's say this is kind of team eco-modernism, um, you know, those who reject the pseudo-religious narrative of, you know, having sinned against uh, Mother Nature by modernizing, by industrializing, having to go back to the Garden of Eden. That's, that's the billion dollar man, folks, um, on one side of this battle of ideas. We have kind of team, uh, you know, innovation, team pragmatism um, on the other side. And I, I would be stretching, and I think to say that annual operating budgets of organizations on that side of, of the battlefield control $10 million, probably less, right? So, I mean, it's astounding that our ideas carry as much traction as they do, particularly in the States, um, given you know, the forces are right here. And I mean, we know that money talk. Tell me about the battle of ideas here and the money behind it. What, where, where is the, where's the money and where's the momentum? Right. I mean, so here's, here's my biblical framing of this here. Um, we have, we have competing, competing ideologies, competing visions for the future, you know, which I, I think I outlaid there with a, you know, a, a, a nuclear future of, you know, high paying union jobs, high tech, STEM, trades jobs grounded in communities versus, you know, being a nation of, of, 
imported Chinese solar panel installers, basically, right? But on on this battlefield, we have you know the traditional environmental NGOs, um, you know, with annual operating budgets of likely over a billion dollars. Groups like the NRDC, Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, uh, Greenpeace, right? And these are folks that subscribe to the pseudo-religious, outdated narrative that we've sinned against Mother Nature and the only way um, forwards is actually backwards um, towards rejecting modernity. Small is beautiful. I mean, fantasy use, stuff, use right? less, work less, be less, don't travel, all and, of and, these things. And, yeah. and, and frankly, you know, those they're, they're prophets of a, of a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of catastrophe, because if we follow their edicts and fail to innovate, we don't use genetic engineering to improve our crops. Um, we don't develop abundant, reliable energy to have air conditioning and power desalination. I mean, then you start having hundreds of millions of people dying maybe from four degrees of climate change by 2100. But all that aside, that's one side of this battlefield, and it's got a billion bucks behind it. On the other side, we have, you know, team eco modernism, team innovation. And I would be very surprised if uh, if that side controls, uh, you know, an annual operating budget of $10 million. I think it's probably half that. Yeah. And I think what's what's most astounding about that is the traction that, you know, eco modern ideas are getting, um, given this vast uh, uh, gas, uh, uh, chasm in, in, in finance and, and money talks in terms of buying influence, in terms of getting media attention, in terms of getting political inten- attention. Um, but I think our arguments have, have the ring of truth behind them and the ring of logic. And if you can actually sit down one-to-one with people, I mean, I've got an amazing track record of, of bringing people around and convincing people on this. And, and it's just common sense, but you know, that's our challenge. That's our, our generational challenge is, is, um, is winning this battle of ideas. Um, it ain't so, going to be easy, Robert, but, but that's what, you know, your podcast is about. That's what my, if I can be so bold, that's what my podcast is about. And I, I think we're, we're going to win eventually. Well, so tell me about that, because as you were talking about that, I thought, you know, I've found a lot of power in doing the power hungry podcast, right? It's just given me a platform and people are contacting me want to be on my crappy little podcast. I'm like, really? You know, it's just me, you know, but it seems that decouple has really given you a different, um, it really changed your, um, your brand. That's another, it changed your profile and given you a different way to, I mean, would any of this have worked if, if you weren't a podcaster, would you have gained this level? I'm just curious how you view decouple with how your, your rise as a pro nuclear and uh, advocate in the public sphere trying to affect policy. How is that? I'm curious. Tell me about that. I don't want to give away all my secrets, but yeah, I mean, I think as you've noticed, the podcast is an incredible sort of social capital instrument, um, an incredibly intimate, uh, you know, form of communication, you know, and I have, I have diehard listeners that I think have listened to every single episode. I mean, that's, and as you know, that's hundreds of hours, um, where you're right inside people's ears and, you know, it's a wonkish, uh, podcast. It's, it's got a, you know, it's not got a huge following. We're nearing 200,000 downloads and I, you know, very excited to get towards a quarter million. That just has a nice ring to it. Sure. Um, but, but I mean, really, really intelligent people are listening to this podcast and it's building a, a, a political culture. For instance, you know, there is a huge social pressures um, to uh, to not um, have any critiques of renewables, right? I mean, the kind of thuggish policing of the discourse around this, where you're labeled a nuclear bro, um, if you have intelligent critiques of, of renewables, is it's it's shocking to me. And so I've I've been able to carve out a space for that, and and I think show leadership um, that one can be articulate, principled. You know, brewery, like nuke bro, brewery is a way of behaving towards other people. You know, it's being an asshole. It's being mm. presumptuous. It's being rude. It's not about a position that you hold. It's not about ideas. Like we need to, the world is so hyperpolarized, Robert. I mean, you know, social media has just created such a toxic landscape. Um, and I think podcasts, long form podcasts cut through the bullshit on that. Yeah. Because you you really get to know someone, you know, you know, as your host, for instance, you get to get a sense of their values. Um, and, and that, you know, I think has has, has tremendous uh, benefits. I mean, I was just at the Canadian Nuclear Association conference um, and there's a decent number of people there that came up to me and said, hey, I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. Mm. And, and that's interesting because, you know, there's some tension between me and the Canadian nuclear um uh, sector, um, certainly parts of it, because, you know, I'm here advocating for the very common sense thing, which is the refurbishment of, you know, four more of our can units at the Pickering nuclear generating station. Um, and for whatever reason, like I was saying that the industry has become so conservative in what their asks are that they've said, right. Oh, that's impossible. 
you know, um, sprinkle some crumbs on, on SMRs without realizing that, you know, my advocacy out here for Pickering and new build can do gets them more goods here. It's good for the whole sector. And I mean, I'm happy to talk about the insanity of, uh, of shutting down Pickering, but, uh, you know, I did want to come back to the Canadian situation and, and really emphasize that, you know, that this is a battle to be won. We're starting to win it. Um, but we have a long way to go. Things, things are not as, as rosy as they might seem from, you know, the destitute scenario that you're facing with nuclear in the United States destitute covers it pretty well i think that's about the right word i mean i uh, you know when you when i see what's happening at the nuclear regulatory commission they pour out the oak low permit application um in january just a few weeks after the chinese started operating commercial oper operation of a high temperature gas reactor in shandong the cutting edge of the cutting edge in china and we just we're just standing here with our teeth in our mouth we can't get anywhere um, but tell me about the, uh, the, the status of the Green Energy Act. I know that this was something, it was under uh, uh, the, the former uh, Premier McGinty, right, that this was passed and then she was thrown out. I mean, they became a rump party, right, in, in, in Ontario. But it, what's the status of the Green Energy Act in, in Ontario now? Yeah, so two premiers, Dalton McGinty, and then his successor, um, and for God's sakes, I'm blanking on her name right now. It'll come back to me. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, so this was, you know, I, I joke and say that Ontario was the France of, of North America. Of course, Quebec has the ties with the French and French language uh, province. But from an energy perspective, you know, France is about 75% nuclear energy and Ontario is 62%. Um, and for whatever reason, and we made this terrible choice um, in 2009 not to refurbish the Pickering units, to let 3,200 megawatts uh, go offline. Luckily, we've had life extension after life extension um, without a full refurbishment, and that's going to come to an end in 2025. Um, I mean, it won't because we're going to be successful. Um, we're going to get the thing refurb. Um, but the Green Energy Act, yeah, I mean, it was um, basically... Uh, long-term locked-in contracts uh, guaranteeing a certain price point for renewables developers. You know, it was rosy. Amory Lovins actually came up to Ontario and advocated for this. Um, so we have, uh, you know, his, uh, his footprints on this as well. But, you know, I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, behind the meter, solar um, was given 80 cents per kilowatt hour. Wow. Um, you know, this, we get hydro uh, for about five or six cents you know, we get nuclear for eight or nine cents, right? Uh, wind is, you know, getting about uh, 18 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, utility solar, uh, 49 cents per kilowatt hour. And get this, Robert, they get paid for every kilowatt they produce, regardless if we need it or not. Right. And we have something, we have something called the lake effect here. So wind in particular, we have uh, about five or six uh, thousand megawatts of wind produces radically out of phase with demand so it, it goes nuts in the fall and the spring when we least need electricity right um, we heat mostly with gas so winter demand isn't that high but summer is is insane right yeah. our, our base load needs are about 10 gigawatts we jump to 26 gigawatts in the summer um when we have these heat waves and you know these are these muggy humid like they, they kill people kind of heat waves right like sure. not 100 percent humidity but you get wet bulb temperatures that are pretty high um and, uh, you know, wind is almost entirely absent, like two, three percent capacity factor during these these critical times. And, and so get this, though. So um, the subsidies that we're paying um, for these contracts, we will have overpaid thirty eight point seven billion dollars on these contracts, which despite the Green Energy Act being canceled by the government, they threw out the liberals who put this in place um, and were thrown out decisively, went from a majority party to losing official party status, like down to six seats or something like right, that from right. over 100. Um, you know, that there was this decision and, and it's, it's this path dependency that's led us to a, a, almost a $40 billion expenditure on this crap. Um, when we could have spent 10 billion on Pickering, um, we're losing that. Um, and, and that has massive climate implications. The, the closure of that nuclear station is going to eliminate all of the emission reductions that we've accomplished as a country since 2005. It's going to add the equivalent just, it's of just, 8 it's, million, 8 it's, million transatlantic flights. It's just incredible. Um, it, it truly is incredible that this this short sightedness and there's the same the same as at play here in the U.S. with the closure of you know Palisades, closure of Indian Point, living yeah. closure of Diablo Canyon, being cheered on by the NGO industrial complex, as you said. But the, but the Green Energy Act was canceled by or uh, it was thrown out by your incoming premier uh, Ford. I've forgotten his first Doug name. Ford. Yeah, yeah, Doug Ford. Doug Ford, right. So, um, but let's talk a little bit about this recent piece. And I know you haven't read it. Uh, I've, I've been reading over it, but this, it was a remarkable piece in Jacobin magazine. It was called in praise of the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was written by Fred Stafford and Matt Huber. 
And it touches on some of these things that you're, we've been talking about here. And there's just a great line in here. And it says, the, though the environmental left may not want to accept it, the small is beautiful approach of decentralized energy provides ideological cover for a ruthless form of renewable energy capitalism. And even worse, it threatens our fight to halt climate change in its tracks. Decentralized energy replaces a high wage industrial union economy with a rentier one with rental economy only flowing to the property uh, property class through net metered solar rooftop solar. I have rooftop solar. The homeowners become an energized petty bourgeoisie and they're looking to collect rents for their solar property from less property, less virtuous workers via the common electrical grid. You know, it's our discussions, you know, Emmett Penny and I, I admire his work, but there's a sensibility about that, what they're talking about this from two avowed Marxists, Stafford and Huber saying they identify as Marxists, yeah. but yeah. identifying the grid is this idea of the common good. And that resonates with me a lot. And it takes me back to the New Deal here in the US where you yeah. had a few, few legislators saying, we need to support the grid because this is the common good. And that seems to have been completely lost now in this, this uh, small is beautiful decentralized energy and ruthless capitalism, which I have documented over and over. These big, in, you know, big wind companies going in and just crushing these small communities, suing them, suing individuals, suing Esther Reitman in Canada with a slap suit. I mean, it's in, it's an intimidation culture is what I see over and over again. I mean, what, what do you, what's your reaction to that Jacobin piece or what, you know, this idea around the, the grid and a different, different concept of the grid, I guess, is the, is the question. Uh, let me ask you a random question, Robert. Sure, um, go ahead. Are you familiar with the Indian caste system at all? You know, that Indian. rigid class system uh, in India, right? The untouchables. The caste system, yeah. yeah but, right, yeah, where your last yeah. name determines your social destiny. So the Brahmins are sort of uh, the priestly class. They're very highly esteemed, very elite. And uh, there's a political scientist, I think it's Thomas Piketty, I could be getting that wrong, who came up with this idea of the Brahmin left. Right. Mm. And essentially, you know, this is what's just astounding to me. You mentioned these Marxist thinkers, right? There's this tiny fringe on, on the left. I'll call it sort of more of an old left that really clings to those values, right? Of, um, you know, of something like the TVA, of, of, of public ownership, right. um, you know, of, of, of real issues that are of importance to working people, affordability, you know, affordable energy. And we have, uh, you know, that, that, and that's a vanishingly small sliver of, of the existing left right now. Right. What we have now is a Brahmin left. And it's interesting because, you know, the left has abandoned the working class. It's now a party of the elites, the urban elites, who are completely divorced from industry, um, completely divorced, divorced from the workplace. They have no engineering discipline. Their en energy policies are complete pie in the sky fantasies, right? Um, and, uh, and those are the people who vote for left parties now. And, and what's interesting is, you know, in Canada, I think like with, with Trump, for instance, the right wing is, is the populist party now because they talk about whether it's genuine or not, right. they talk right. about issues of affordability, things that actually matter to working class people. Um, so, I mean, we have a real, real crisis of the left and who's there to champion that vision, which I, I agree with you, I think is the most efficient way um, to build out affordable, uh, affordable energy system, which should be of interest to the entire political spectrum, because, you know, cheap, abundant, reliable, affordable energy is the basis. It's the, you know, as Isaac Orr says, it's the secret ingredient in everything. Right. If you want prosperity and ultimately if you want climate action. And that's that's the the precursor and we're coming out of you know what i call the amory lovins decades about 50 years where we've had stagnation or zero growth on the grid and you know the what the climate hawks will tell you is you know for net zero um we need to electrify everything i know you had a real bad experience with that in texas uh last february robert um <laughs> you know if we're going to electrify everything it better be goddamn ultra reliable electricity which means it's basically got to be mostly nuclear right. and and we, we have a shit ton of it to build. And our, our policymakers, our intellectuals, our intelligentsia have no experience with that golden age of growing our grid, you know, right from, you know, the Pearl Station in Edison in 1880s up until the 1970s. Um, and, you know, and, and like they have this and they have this fantasy that, oh, we're just going to make this massive expansion of the grid. Right. Bill McKibben is saying, oh, yeah, we'll just double or triple the amount of electricity we're producing. Really? Well, those those, I, those you know, ideologues have crippled the electrify everything agenda with because this, it can't you know, be done. It, it, it can't it, be done. It can't be done. Uh, given the grid that we have, their ideas around renewables. Oh, we're going to have to build all this in additional transmission. It's not going to happen. And yet, this is the. I mean, this is the accepted wisdom, and it is not. There is not the the, the other part of the clerisy, as Joel Kotkin calls them. 
is your, your idea about the Brahmin left and the NGO, the industrial complex. Well, it's complemented by a media class that has no none of the things you just talked about, no engineering discipline, no understanding of history in terms of the grid or where it came from. And so it's a gullible kind of just repeat or repeat continual repeat of these same what I would think are called just big lies around this idea of the energy transition. But yeah, this, well, uh, this idea of electrify everything, it's going it, 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 to your point, I think we have to make sure we have the nuclear capacity first that can can electrify everything before we make that leap. And yet instead, it's, oh, we're going to close all this stuff and do it all with renewables. It's just, it's a it's a it's a recipe for disaster. And we're seeing that now with the, the de declining reliability of the grid in the US. I got a great line for you, Robert. I just sure. came up with it right now. You know, speaking of, speaking of this, you know, decentralized, small is beautiful fantasy, which you just said it can't be done. Well, it can't be done, but it can be modeled, Robert. <laughs> it can be modeled, <laughs> and of course, we should we should uh, you know ignore uh, you know lived experience. We should ignore the whole uh, political and financial um, you know milieu of of the actual demonstrated build out of our grid you know, the glory days of the 60s and 70s, right? right. Um, where we were adding 5% capacity. We need to replicate that. And we have a lot of historical lessons to learn. But as I was saying, we have the lost decades of Amory Levins, um, and we have no no experience in terms of our, our, our policymakers and intelligentsia with with that that experience. And that's what we need to go back and study. And I, I was honored to have Edgardo Sepulveda on, you know, who's our, like my sort of consultant uh, energy economist. Um, and we really explored that in a recent episode, looking at, well, what were those preconditions, right? Mm. Um, and we've got serious work to do, especially if we're going to do it with nuclear. And again, that's where there's this Canadian advantage because we have this ramped up supply chain, ramped up workforce. You know, it's still, it's the West, right? So it's still a little bit precarious, but yeah, we're, we're miles ahead uh, of the U S and, you know, this is a, you know, as a sort of lifelong progressive, uh, you know, anti-imperialist, I've, I've, I've sort of in my youth, I had this naive idea of sort of, well, fuck, let it burn, let it degenerate. You know, what's, you know, the U S empire, like it's, it's inflicting, uh, you know, all these unnecessary wars of aggression around the world, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it's interesting having a kid living in the West and thinking, fuck, I don't want to see the West decline. I want my kid to grow up in a healthy society and a healthy sure. economy. Um, and I have a huge preoccupation with the way in which we're offshoring heavy industry, offshoring. We'd had sort of deindustrialization 1.0 with the sort of neoliberal globalization economic revolution. And now we're having deindustrialization 2.0 because our energy prices are completely out of control. And we can't compete with places like China and Vietnam that use coal and have shitty environmental regulations and horrible labor laws and forced Uyghur labor. Um, so, you know, we have to really wake up our policymakers, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy that Canada still has, you know, that supply chain and, and, and those, you know, quality just transition jobs, um, that the, you know, the green left talks about, um, you know, theoretically, um, but completely ignores, um, right. and, you know, we, we, we accomplished a just transition in, in Ontario and, and something I'm very proud of. So let me ask you about Ontario Power Generation, because it was in March um, that uh, uh, Ohio uh, Ontario Power Generation announced that they had uh, it would work with GE Hitachi on the SMR at the Darlington site. Um, so tell me about that, if you can bring us. Do you know, do you, have you followed that fairly closely? What's what is that? Uh, what What is the reactor that they're planning on using there? Do you know that? And can you give us any yeah. particulars on that? Yeah, I mean, so it's uh, it's uh, you know a boiling water reactor. This is kind of the the oldest technology in the block. They were technologically conservative. Obviously, I think it's the I mean, it's X. It's the tenth iteration of this technology. It's really been mastered. It's a it's an elegant and beautiful design. It's over engineered in terms of safety. Um, you know, it's got um, you know condensers which will allow I think up to twelve days of of passive cooling of of the plant. I mean, so it really it's 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 uh, old technology, but it's been been refined and probably overly safety. Um, it's a 300 megawatt reactor. So, you know, we're taking a one step forwards for 10 step backwards, losing 3200 megawatts with closing pickering. But I'm I'm you know, I'm not a what about both guy when it comes to nuclear and renewables. I think they um, actually don't coexist very well. And, you know, renewables basically mean you need a full backup system and they're, they're just, uh, you know, an extravagant uh, um add-on that's quite expensive but with nuclear yes we need the large stuff and we do need this we do need these smrs and um you know again canada is a first mover in the west on smrs you mentioned china's you know they hooked up a 200 megawatt reactor in, in pakistan a little while ago right um you know they're they're about to really i think jump into the lead as russia loses its export market and is sanctioned and rosatom takes a nosedive um but in the west canada is leading the way um with smr technology um we have a plan to build a, a bunch more 
Um, I think it's very dangerous to put all of our eggs in the SMR basket because, you know, we're not going to overcome economies of scale on our first build of a first of a kind 300 megawatt reactor. Sure. You know, what we know about modular building and there's exciting stuff like steel bricks, you know, really trying to modularize this, trying to be efficient with construction. Um, it's going to be a lot of lessons to be learned there. I mean, I wish them all the success in the world. I understand from, uh, you know, some inside sources that they're doing an absolutely bang up job uh, developing and preparing for this. Um, but it is likely that it's going to go a little over cost and over budget. I mean, I hope I'm wrong on that. Um, and if we put all of our eggs in that basket, um, there could be blowback from it. But there's enormous opportunity here because there's interest around the world, particularly in the West, in Europe, um, for SMRs, um, and particularly for smaller countries like Estonia, um, right. And even some bigger countries like like Poland. Um, and as a first mover, we have the opportunity to capture, you know, even though it's U.S. technology and enriched fuel, which we don't do, um, we will be cut out of the fuel fabrication unless we really get our shit together on that. Um, we will be making the reactor pressure vessel, at least for this one here in Canada. I was amazed that we have heavy forging capacity to do that, you know, in a town I grew up next to in Cambridge, Ontario. But, you know, we're going to be doing that. And we have a, we have an opportunity to capture some of that supply chain, you know, really support Europe um, in, in getting off of Russian fuel, you know, getting their energy dependence back. Um, so, so, you know, it's something I've become more, more bullish on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's yet another sort of Canadian advantage. Um, it, it feels nice to be able to say some good things about, about my country and, and what we're doing. Well, I, you know, I'm glad to hear it and, and, and uh, rather envious, to be honest with you, because I just feel, you know, like I said, the U.S., we're, we're just stuck here. And we've got an administration that has no, no apparent interest in preserving our existing reactors or developing new ones. And uh, uh, I say that with no joy whatsoever. But if the, the, they're clearly not paying attention to what's happening in Europe and the need for, for greater energy security. And I think it's but, but let me go back to the, the part about the Canadian government involvement here. One of the things that's key here as well is that you have uh, part of your pensions uh, are in government pensions are, are investors in Bruce Power, right? So you have a uh, you have government invested in the nuclear sector as well. So that's another just one other quick facet of this, if you don't mind, just touch on that briefly, because I think we talked about it in the last time you were on the show. But that's another reason why you've got, a, a, I think, a more sympathetic ear. Is that fair to say in government that you have government investment in your nuclear sector? Well, I mean, we it's, it's the uh, OMERS, which is a municipal workers union. And I mean, patient capital is what works beautifully with nuclear. You know, if you want yeah. a secure long term payback for your members and, and secure their retirement, this is the way to go. And they own, I think, 43 percent of the world's largest operating nuclear plant. Not only them, but the power workers union, I believe, owns a three percent stake as well. So, I mean, this is a, just a beautiful model and the model the left should really be getting behind. Um, you know, the, and, again, and just, to, just to be clear, if I, I'm interrupting here, but mm -hmm. uh, so the the you said the Ohio Power Workers Union they own 43 percent of the, Bruce, no, no, which the, not not the Ohio, uh, but they're called Power Workers uh, Union. Uh, the power. I'm sorry if I said Ohio. Yeah. The, so the Power Workers Union, their pension owns 43 percent of Bruce, which owns which owns Pickering. So 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 there's a municipal workers union that owns 43 percent, but the okay. Power Workers Union itself owns uh, I think two or three percent oh, okay. of the world's okay. largest workers, operating thank you. nuclear okay. facility. Yeah. You know, one last thing I, I kind of want to get in here uh, sure. before before we close, um, you know, in terms of climate in Canada, you know, the oil sands are kind of this bet noir of, of climate. You know, when we, we, we released our emissions reduction uh, 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 plan, uh, the federal government did recently, you know, oil and gas is 25 percent of our emissions. Transportation is 25 percent of our emissions. Those are the big chunks. Electricity is only like 8 mm. percent. You know, we have so much hydro. We're doing pretty well. Right. Um, you know, and and. The oil sands, you know, have this this terrible reputation, and I mean, they are. It's very carbon intensive. We need to do steam injection to liberate the bitumen to get it out. Sure. Um, but we also have, um, I don't know what the opposite of a bet noir is, but we have we have uh, Canadian uranium, which is uh, really extraordinary. Um, and you know, again, here's an example of the industry really not doing a very good job advocating for itself. There's a lot of bullshit offset stuff happening in the world right like oh i'm going to set aside this forest um it burns down anyway because it's been poorly managed or climate change well there goes the carbon right but i i got some dollars off it i helped bail right. out a polluting industry in, in the west well the the canadian uranium sector i just did the back of the envelope calculations on this you know globally um nuclear displaces 125th of all of humanity's annual ghg emissions two two gigatons 
50 is the number to, to remember 50 we put okay. it every year we, we offset two gigatons by not burning fossil fuels and doing nuclear instead canada is the third largest uranium exporter um you know the last numbers i have is about 13 percent. that may jump with the instability in kazakhstan and you know russia makes a lot of fuel so we could really uh, do more than that but we offset fully one third of our national annual emissions in canada with our uranium sector in terms of the way that uranium is used domestically and internationally mm. And again, we have the richest ore grades in the world. Up to like, the global average is one percent uh, ore grade. We have a mine in uh, Saskatchewan that's got twenty percent ore grade. Wow. So the environment, the environmental impact is absolutely minimal. And we're using, you know, it's the best regulated mining sector in the world. Not only like uh, Canadian level mining regulations, which are so different from those in the developed world, but also there's separate nuclear, uh, you know, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission regulations. So this is a airtight regulated sector with radon levels in the mine way lower than your basement um and you know but this is not being sold so you know i mentioned that there's this kind of schizophrenic contradiction in in the in the government's uh talk about nuclear we had a former uh, minister of natural resources who was super bullish but when our prime ministers asked about nuclear you know at cop 26 he says oh we're doing wind we're doing solar um you know decarbonization can be difficult so we have to have a lot of options on the table and kind of maybe sort of should maybe possibly do nuclear and you know what i say to liberal lawmakers is like you know your your prime minister needs to get out there and brag you know the the coal phase in ontario we we, we had a 25 percent coal grid we replaced that with nuclear it was it was north america's greatest greenhouse gas reduction you know we offset one third of our national emissions with our uranium sector you know we produce 50 percent of the world's cobalt 60 which sterilizes 40 percent of the world's single-use medical devices we save Fuck, I mean, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives by by providing that sterility to modern healthcare. Like, people don't don't get the. I mean, the fundamental role that nuclear plays, but particularly Canada, Canada's nuclear and our beautiful Canada reactor, which not only has such a great success record at decarbonization, cleaning up our air, reducing smog days in my city from fifty three to zero uh, by phasing out coal. Uh, but also this this medical isotope success story, which is a unique feature of of Canada Reactor. So, you know, I'm very optimistic about Canada. I think um, I think we're going to win. I think we're going to be uh, refurbishing Pickering. I think we're going to build a bunch of new Candus. You know, to double our electric grid to electrify everything, um, we need to build the equivalent of 96 large Canada reactors. Um, it would be the equivalent of something like 50 Hoover dams. Um, so there's an enormous amount of infrastructure that's that's got to get built. You know, bonds built. Um, this country, they built your country too. They built the the infrastructure that makes us a modern, you know, advanced economy. Um, bonds need to include nuclear. I think that's a real important mechanism. You know, government needs to be involved. It can be private capital that's being borrowed um, and, at ultra and, low and, interest and, rates. And let me interrupt there, but you're, you're, those bonds you're talking about that that it's critical that nuclear be included included under this green bond. Uh, uh, definition that the Canadian government's now working through. And that's, that's part of the conflict now or the issues you're working through right now. Yeah. Is that that's Abs correct? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, um, you know, in my discussions with high level uh, government uh, figures in the caucus in the cabinet, um, they were saying, Ooh, kind of our bad. This was the first iteration. You know, this was a, a Gilbo move um, mm. from what I understand. You know, he was, his, his uh, office was, the the most responsible for for you know excluding nuclear and listing it as a sin stock uh, but they were really saying like is there some other mechanism um that we can show our support for nuclear and we do have this canadian infrastructure bank that's about 100 billion dollars and and the budget you know included nuclear um in the mandate of that bank and they sprinkled about 120 million dollars on smr regulation and development um so we are seeing a positive step i think it's you know the the drips of water before the flood um, you know, just as we've seen the impossible happen in Europe with, again, Boris Johnson, you know, going from, well, maybe we'll do size, we'll see, we're not sure, uh, to committing to, you know, a nuclear reactor every year. Um, you know, they've, they've formed a conservative government has formed a crown corporation or, or a, an investment vehicle to streamline the building of nuclear in the UK, right? To speed up uh, regulatory processes, siting, to coordinate private capital, uh, to get these plants built. They've got the regulated asset base now to de-risk capital, get it cheap. So we're seeing, you know, if the rubber meets the road, if you have an energy crisis, if fossil fuels are really expensive, you find a way. And there is a way, and we've seen it over and over again around the world in response to the OPEC crisis in the 70s. We saw France build 54 reactors in something like 15 years. And I'm, I'm optimistic we're gonna see it again. The only problem is, is that the West deindustrialized. 
you know, we globalized. Um, we have a lot of work to do. You know, it's a real wake up call, I think, for policymakers to abandon those Amory Lovins uh, decades to have a industrial policy. Um, it's it's a tremendous challenge, uh, but I, I remain. You always ask what what gives me hope, so I'm going to preempt that question. Sure. What um, gives you what gives you hope? That that the best ideas will rise to the top, and that you, despite being you know under resourced, I mean I have I'm, I suck at orders of magnitude, but you know at least a thousand to one, maybe ten thousand to one, that our ideas are so strong and so compelling, um, and we're developing a, a you know nuclear advocacy community that's so articulate um, that despite those odds we're going to convince policymakers um, and also just the facts on the ground are going to convince policymakers because the only thing as good or better than fossil fuels thermodynamically is nuclear. You know, we've had this, this wasted decade of historically cheap energy, uh, historically cheap capital, um, easy times, climate change concerns can blossom in easy times and we've wasted it, you know, on, on a renewables heavy build out which has not delivered on deep decarbonization, maybe modestly spared some fossil fuels here or there. It's energy infrastructure that lasts 20 or 30 years and then needs to be ripped down and rebuilt. It destroys landscapes, it destroys wildlife, it kills eagles, it kills, you know, you know I know birds are dear to you, Robert. Um, but I mean, it, you know, fundamentally, um, it's, it's been an enormous, an enormous waste um, and a distraction from, from, you know, the thermodynamically viable replacement of, of fossil fuels, um, you know, Net zero is not a decades uh, process. If you follow Václav Smil, if you study energy transition, I mean, this is probably centuries. But I mean, I'm a climate hawk. Let's 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 get to work, and we can do good things for the climate. We can do great things for you know economic prosperity, for energy security, for our societies, for our children, and and it's vital. And that's what you know bizarrely drives me to do this all as a volunteer for free. I'm a weird guy, Robert, but you know here I am, um, and I'll, I'll I'll carry the fight forward. Well, I think that's a good way to stop right there. I think you've uh, you've hit the coda there. Just uh, note perfect. Um, well, that's great, Chris. I've you know I've, I've watched you develop this for a long time and the growth of your podcast. Congratulations on all of it, and uh, you know keep it up. I'm, I think it's great what you're doing, and uh, you know keep keep it keep at it. Well, I mean, you're you're a huge mentor of mine, Robert, and you know the fact that I can preempt your questions means that I you know I, I listen to just about every episode you put out. <laughs> um, so thank you for what you do as well, and it's it's just it's beautiful being part of this budding ecosystem and this uh, you know warriors in this battle of ideas together. So uh, you know, thank you for what you do as well. Well, that's very kind. Thanks. So uh, to all of you in podcast land, uh, this has been, you've wasted, as, t as the, the Tappet brothers used to say, you've wasted a perfectly good hour here with uh, <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> but I'm glad you did. Um, and thanks to my guest, uh, Chris Kiefer. He is the director of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. You can find out more about his work at C4, that's the numeral four, C4NE.ca. Chris, thanks again for being on the Power Hungry podcast. My absolute pleasure, Robert. Thanks for having me back. And thanks to all of you in podcast land. See you next time on right here on this uh, podcast channel. See you.